Now, chapter 9, The Killing of Kamsa. After Kamsa's wrestlers expressed their determination, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the killer of Madhu, confronted Chanura, and Lord Balaram, the son of Rohini, confronted Mushtik. Krishna and Chanura, and then Balaram and Mushtik, locked themselves hand to hand, leg to leg, and each began to press against the other with a view to come out victorious. They joined palm to palm, calf to calf, head to head, chest to chest, and began to strike each other. The fighting increased as they pushed one another from one place to another. One captured another and threw him down on the ground, and another rushed from the back to the front of another and tried to overcome him with a hold. The fighting increased step by step. There was picking up, dragging and pushing, and then the legs and hands were locked together. All the arts of wrestling were perfectly exhibited by the parties as each tried his best to defeat his opponent. But the audience in the wrestling arena was not very satisfied because the combatants did not appear to be equally matched. They considered Krishna and Balaram to be mere boys before the wrestlers Chanura and Mushtik, who were huge men as solid as stone. Being compassionate and favoring Krishna and Balaram, many members of the audience began to talk as follows. Dear friends, there is danger here. Another said, Even in front of the king, this wrestling is going on between incompatible sides. The audience had lost their sense of enjoyment. They could not encourage the fighting between the strong and the weak. So they said, Mushtik and Chanura are just like thunderbolts, as strong as great mountains. And Krishna and Balaram are two delicate boys of very tender age. The principle of justice has already left this assembly. Persons who are aware of the civilized principles of justice will not remain to watch this unfair match. Those taking part in this wrestling match are not very much enlightened. Therefore, whether they speak or remain silent, they are being subjected to the reactions of sinful activities. But my dear friends, another in the assembly spoke out, just look at the face of Krishna. There are drops of perspiration on his face from chasing his enemy, and his face appears like the lotus flower with drops of water. And do you see how the face of Lord Balaram has turned especially beautiful? There is a reddish hue on his white face because he is engaged in a strong wrestling match with Mushtik. Ladies in the assembly also addressed one another. Dear friends, just imagine how fortunate is the land of Vrindavan, where the Supreme Personality of Godhead Himself is present, always decorated with flower garlands and engaged in tending cows along with His brother, Lord Balaram. He is always accompanied by His cowherd boyfriends and He plays His transcendental flute. The residents of Vrindavan are fortunate to be able to constantly see the lotus feet of Krishna and Balaram, which are worshipped by great demigods like Lord Shiva and Brahma and the goddess of fortune. We cannot estimate how many pious activities were executed by the damsels of Brajabhumi so that they were able to enjoy the Supreme Personality of Godhead and look on the unparalleled beauty of his transcendental body. The beauty of the Lord is beyond compare. No one is higher than or equal to him in beauty of complexion or bodily luster. Krishna and Balaram are the reservoir of all kinds of opulence, namely wealth, strength, beauty, fame, knowledge, and renunciation. The gopis are so fortunate that they can see and think of Krishna 24 hours a day, beginning from their milking the cows or husting the paddy or churning the butter in the morning. While engaged in cleaning their houses 
and washing their floors, they are always absorbed in thought of Krishna. The gopis give a perfect example of how one can execute Krishna consciousness even if he is in different types of material engagement. By constantly being absorbed in the thought of Krishna, one cannot be affected by the contamination of material activities. The gopis, therefore, are perfectly in trance, samadhi, the highest perfectional stage of mystic power. In the Bhagavad Gita it is confirmed that one who is constantly thinking of Krishna is a first-class yogi among all kinds of yogis. My dear friends, one lady told another, we must accept the gopis' activities to be the highest form of piety. Otherwise, how could they have achieved the opportunity of seeing Krishna both morning and evening when he goes to the pasturing ground with his cows and cowherd boyfriends and returns in the evening? They frequently see him playing on his flute and smiling very brilliantly. When Lord Krishna, the super soul of every living being, understood that the ladies in the assembly were anxious for him, he decided not to continue wrestling but to kill the wrestlers immediately. The parents of Krishna and Balaram, namely Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, Vasudev and Devaki, were also very anxious because they did not know the unlimited strength of their children. Lord Balaram was fighting with the wrestler Mushtik in the same way that Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was fighting and wrestling with Chanura. Lord Krishna appeared to be cruel to Chanura, and he immediately struck him thrice with his fist. The great wrestler was jolted to the astonishment of the audience. Chanura then took his last chance and attacked Krishna just as one hawk swoops upon another. Folding his two hands, he began to strike the chest of Krishna. But Lord Krishna was not even slightly disturbed, no more than an elephant that is hit by a flower garland. Krishna quickly caught the two hands of Chanura and began to wheel him around. And simply by this centrifugal action, Chanura lost his life. Krishna then threw him to the ground. Chanura fell, just like the flag of Indra, and all his nicely decorated ornaments were scattered hither and thither. Mushtik also struck Balaram, and Balaram returned the stroke with great force. Mushtik began to tremble, and blood and vomit flowed from his mouth. Distressed, he gave up his vital force and fell down, just like a tree falls down in a hurricane. After the two wrestlers were killed, a wrestler named Kut came forward. Lord Balaram immediately caught him in his left hand and killed him nonchalantly. A wrestler of the name of Shal came forward, and Krishna immediately kicked him and cracked his head. A wrestler named Toshal came forward and was killed in the same way. Thus, all the great wrestlers were killed by Krishna and Balaram and the remaining wrestlers began to flee from the assembly out of fear for their lives. All the cowherd boyfriends of Krishna and Balaram approached them and congratulated them with great pleasure. While drums beat and they talked of the victory, the leg bells on the feet of Krishna and Balaram tinkled. All the people gathered there began to clap in great ecstasy, and no one could estimate the bounds of their pleasure. The Brahmins present began to praise Krishna and Balaram ecstatically. Only Kamsa was morose. He neither clapped nor offered benediction to Krishna. Kamsa resented the drums being beaten for Krishna's victory. 
and he was very sorry that the wrestlers had been killed and had fled the assembly. He therefore immediately ordered the drum playing to stop and began to address his friends as follows. I order that these two sons of Vasudev be immediately driven out of Mathura. The cowherd boys who have come with them should be plundered and all their riches taken away. Nanda Maharaj should immediately be arrested and killed for his cunning behavior. And the rascal Vasudev should also be killed without delay. Also, my father Ugrasen, who has always supported my enemies against my will, should be killed. When Kamsa spoke in this way, Lord Krishna became very angry with him, and within a second he jumped over the high guards of King Kamsa. Kamsa was prepared for Krishna's attack, for he knew from the beginning that he was to be the supreme cause of his death. He immediately unsheathed his sword and prepared to answer the challenge of Krishna with sword and shield. As Kamsa wielded his sword up and down, hither and thither, Lord Krishna, the supreme powerful Lord, caught hold of him with great force. The supreme personality of Godhead, who is the shelter of the complete creation, and from whose lotus navel the whole creation is manifested, immediately knocked the crown from the head of Kamsa and grabbed his long hair in his hand. He then dragged Kamsa from his seat to the wrestling dais and threw him down. Then Krishna at once straddled his chest and began to strike him over and over again. Simply from the strokes of his fist, Kamsa lost his vital force. To assure his parents that Kamsa was dead, Lord Krishna dragged him just as a lion drags an elephant after killing it. When people saw this, there was a great roaring sound from all sides as some spectators expressed their jubilation and others cried in lamentation. From the day Kamsa heard he would be killed by the eighth son of Devaki, he was always thinking of Krishna with his wheel in hand. And because he was very much afraid of his death, he was thinking of Krishna in that form 24 hours a day without stopping, even while eating, while walking, and while breathing. And naturally, he got the blessing of liberation. In the Bhagavad Gita it is stated, Sada Tad Baba Bhavata. A person gets his next life according to the thoughts in which he is always absorbed. Kamsa was thinking of Krishna with his wheel, which means Narayan, who holds a wheel, conchel, lotus flower, and club. According to the opinion of authorities, Kamsa attained Sarukya Mukti after death. That is to say, he attained the same form as Narayan or Vishnu. On the Vaikuntha planets, all the inhabitants have the same bodily features as Narayan. After his death, Kamsa attained liberation and was promoted to Vaikuntha Loka. From this instance, we can understand that even a person who thinks of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as an enemy gets liberation or a place in a Vaikuntha planet. So what to speak of the pure devotees who are always absorbed in favorable thoughts of Krishna? Even an enemy killed by Krishna gets liberation and is placed in the impersonal Brahma Jyoti. Since the Supreme Personality of Godhead is all good, anyone thinking of him either as an enemy or as a friend gets liberation. But the liberation of the devotee and the liberation of the enemy 
are not the same. The enemy generally gets the liberation of Sayuja, merging into the infinite light, and sometimes he gets Sarupya liberation, obtaining a similar form of the Lord. Kamsa had eight brothers headed by Kanka, all of them younger than he, and when they learned that their elder brother had been killed, they combined together and rushed towards Krishna in great anger to kill him. Kamsa and his brothers were all Krishna's maternal uncles, brothers of Krishna's mother Devaki. When Krishna killed Kamsa, he killed his maternal uncle which is against the regulations of Vedic injunctions. Although Krishna is independent of all Vedic injunctions, he violates the Vedic injunctions only in inevitable cases. Kamsa could not be killed by anyone but Krishna. Therefore, Krishna was obliged to kill him. But as far as Kamsa's eight brothers were concerned, Balaram took charge of killing them. Balaram's mother, Rohini, although the wife of Vasudev, was not the sister of Kamsa. Therefore, Balaram took charge of killing all of Kamsa's eight brothers. He immediately took up an available weapon, most probably the elephant's tusk which he carried, and killed the eight brothers one after another, just as a lion kills a flock of deer. Krishna and Balaram thus verified the statement that the Supreme Personality of Godhead appears to give protection to the pious and to kill the impious demons who are always enemies of the demigods. The demigods from the higher planetary systems began to shower flowers congratulating Krishna and Balaram. Among the demigods were powerful personalities like Lord Brahma and Shiva, and all joined together in showing their jubilation over Kamsa's death. There were beating of drums and showering of flowers from the heavenly planets, and the wives of the demigods danced in ecstasy. The wives of Kamsa and his eight brothers were aggrieved at the sudden death of their husbands, and all of them struck their foreheads and shed torrents of tears. Crying loudly and embracing the bodies of their husbands, the wives of Kamsa and his brothers lamented, addressing the dead bodies. Our dear husbands, you are so kind and are the protectors of your dependents. Now, after your death, we are also dead, along with your homes and children. We no longer look auspicious. On account of your death, the auspicious functions to take place, such as the sacrifice of the bow, have all been spoiled. Our dear husbands, you treated persons ill, persons who were faultless, and as a result, you have been killed. This is inevitable because a person who torments an innocent person must be punished by the laws of nature. We know that Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the Supreme Master and Supreme Enjoyer of everything. Therefore, one who neglects his authority can never be happy. And ultimately, as you have, he meets death. Since Krishna was kind and affectionate to his aunts, he solaced them as far as possible. The ritualistic ceremonies performed after death were then conducted under the personal supervision of Krishna because he happened to be the nephew of all the dead princes. After finishing this business, Krishna and Balaram immediately released their father and mother, Vasudeva and Devaki, who had been imprisoned by Kamsa. Krishna and Balaram fell at their parents' feet 
and offered them prayers. Vasudev and Devaki had suffered so much trouble because Krishna was their son. It was because of Krishna that Kamsa was always giving them trouble. Devaki and Vasudev were fully conscious of Krishna's exalted position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, although Krishna touched their feet and offered them obeisances and prayers, they did not embrace him, but simply stood up to hear the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although Krishna was born as their son, Vasudeva and Devaki were always conscious of his position. Thus ends the Bhakti Vedanta purport of the second volume, ninth chapter of Krishna, The Killing of Kamsa.